Hello and wel welcome now to the um, Flash Talk uh, session. So in the next uh, few minutes, we will hear short two minute Flash Talks from selected poster presentation that uh, give us a brief flavor of what you can learn later on their posters. And the first speaker is Alejandro Rodriguez Garcia. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, hello everyone, and thanks for the opportunity to present our work on adaptive learning with neuromodulated SNMs. So, the inherent complexity of biological neural networks makes them adaptable, robust, and efficient, ensuring the survival of living, living beings. So, uh, so. so how, how can we incorporate these features into AI systems? Our, our approach focuses on the neuron specific neuromodulation and to control learning not only at the synaptic level but also at the neuronal level. As an example, we consider a repetitive task where we reinforce the continuum firing of two neurons through dopamine STDP learning. In addition, we incorporate noradrenaline and acetylcholine to dynamically switch the firing pattern of excitatory neurons between regular spiking and bursting modes. Essentially, we observe that bursting activity enhances learning by increasing plasticity of the network, making the system more flexible. However, this flexibility reduces the stability in the learning state by inducing, introducing noradrenaline and acetylcholine as switches between bursts and regular We can achieve fast and stable learning, enhancing adaptability of the system. As an intuitive explanation, neuromodulators may enhance learning by switching neuro the neuro network spiking type. Noradrenaline. First, flatters the landscape of the accessible states by increasing the network plasticity, allowing the network to easily access various states. However, this flexibility also brings in instability. It depends the energy state, stabilizing the system in the learning state and promoting robustness. This illustrates how neuromodulated specific learning can enable adaptability in specific net networks. If you're interested, come to my poster. I will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Um, and then we're just going on to our next speaker, who is uh, Alexandre Guillon. Um, go ahead. Um, so, hi, everyone. Um, so this work has been done in Toulouse, uh, in France, under the supervision of Timothée Masquelier. And the idea was to um, investigate the Valois observation in the primary visual cortex. Um, so he found that there were two different types of non-directional neurons, um, one with a fast and biphasic response, and one with a slower and monophasic response. And the hypothesis he made is that we use uh, the latencies between these, those two neurons um, kind of as a, a rate chart detector to, to detect motion. So we wanted to investigate this in a, a spiking neural network, in the neuron from our spiking neural network. So we fitted a spiking neural network on a neural response fit fitting task. Um, we, we had state-of-the-art accuracy results. Uh, we used essential uh, learnable delays in the spiking neural network. And now uh, the important thing we wanted to do was to uh, investigate the biological tu tuning of our neurons. So in order to do that, we found an optimal grating for each of the neurons of the spiking neural network. Um, using a, a directional sele selectivity index, we found a distribution um, resembling very much the one from macaque v1. Then more importantly, the main observation is that we looked at the reaction, reaction time between the time we present a neuron, uh, its optimal grating, and the time of its first spike. And what we had is a distribution um, of those latencies that displayed clearly two different populations, one with the fast responses and one with slower responses that may suggest um, a mechanism like a rate chart detector uh, and maybe corroborate the Valois hypothesis. So if you want to know more, uh, I'd be glad to talk about the results in detail. Julia, you're muted. So thank you very much for the presentation. And our next speaker is um, Jesus Andreas um, Espinoza 
Valverde. Hopefully I pronounced it correctly. You, uh, go ahead. Hello, everyone. I'm again Jesus Espinosa uh, from the University of Wuppertal. And I am excited to present our work on uh, event-based eligibility propagation with additional bio-inspired features. Uh, eligibility propagation or EPROP is a method that approximates back propagation through time, but in, uh, designed to be more biologically plausible. Um, we, in, in our work, we implement EPROP as an event-based mechanism for synapses where plasticity computations are triggered by spikes. For this purpose, we we use the uh, the archiving mechanism proposed by Statmans et al. in 2020, and we implemented it in, in Nest, which is a, a leading simulator of uh, spiking neural networks. We also introduced several bioinspired uh, uh, modifications. For instance, we make learning agnostic to concepts like uh, learning periods or batches. So uh, a plasticity is strictly driven by uh, uh, by uh, neural activity or, or spikes. Also, we explore ideas like uh, going beyond uh, cross entropy for classification, and also we include some details that were ignored for uh, during the, the, the initial uh, model, like uh, uh, delays between the recurrent new, uh, layer and output uh, layer that we include, and that makes sense uh, within uh, a simulator like Nest, and also other additions that I will discuss further. Uh, during my poster presentation. What we found is that uh, the, this version of EPRO with additional features uh, matches the performance of the, uh, of the original model. And if it's better, uh, a, a neural network, uh, um, a, simulate, a modern simulator as, as Nest. Uh, so that's, 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 uh, that's it. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thanks for your presentation. Unfortunately, we couldn't see your slides, but I hope um, oh, really? some people can come to your poster. But um, let's still go on to our next presenter, um, who is uh, Richard Gao. And um, yes, you can start now. Hi. Uh, so do you want to go back to him? Because we couldn't see his slides at all. Maybe let's that. do this at the end, because I can't see him show up in the ring. So maybe uh, let's go on okay. and see if we can put them in the end. Can you see my slides? No. Or one slide? Are, are you sharing? I think so. Uh, present. Oh, what now? Still no. Okay, I'll just talk. Um, so essentially, the stuff that I'm going to be presenting is um, on using machine learning to fit spiking neural networks with a lot of different parameters. Um, so if you have a, if you're an experimentalist, yeah, the slides are not showing up. I'm not sure why. Um, oh, let's see if this works now. Oh, no? It seems, yeah, yeah now we can do it. Great. Oh, okay. Okay, in one minute, if you're an experimentalist, you can now use spiking networks and machine learning to infer some hidden parameters from your data. Uh, if you're a modeler, which I think most of you are, you are, if you're tired of tuning spiking networks by hand, now you can use machine learning. And then if you're a theorist and you are interested in some of the stuff that like Bill and uh, uh, Kristen talked about, about degeneracy and diversity in your network and how that af affects population dynamics, that's basically the who and why you should come to my poster. And if you don't want to come to the poster, you can check out the preprint here. Uh, the paper is already online. So I think I'm done. <laughs> Thank you very much for uh, the short and nice um, improvised kind of thing now. Um, and I guess we go to the next um, presenter, um, who is uh, Tian Shu Li. And yeah, your two, two minutes start now. OK, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Tian Shu Li. I'm from Stony Brook University. I'm not going to show you a slide. I try my best to track your attention by purely talking. So the title of my poster is Neural Mechanisms for Strategy-Dependent Decision-Making in the Prefrontal Cortex. We're interested in understanding the mechanism of the context-dependent decision-making because the ability to adjust behavior according to context is essential to survival. To investigate this, we studied a task where the monkeys were asked to make decisions using different strategies under different contexts. We first analyzed the population activity of neurons recorded in the prefrontal cortex and tried to understand 
when and how the decisions were made during the task. Then we constructed a spiking neural network in SNN based on what we have learned from the neural dynamics. The SNN achieved a correct rate comparable to that of the monkeys, and it captured the complexity of the neural activity. Its architecture suggested possible mechanisms for storing information, inferring strategies, and integrating memory with strategies to make decisions. At the behavioral level, we observed that the monkeys exhibited a preference for one target when they were allowed to choose freely between two options. We also observed such preference in the SNN. Notably, we did not implement that in the model's design. To further investigate, we trained artificial recurrent neural networks, RNNs, to perform the same task. The trained RNNs also exhibited such preference, but not the same way as the monkeys and the SNN did. So if you'd like to learn more about our work, please visit my poster. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think we're missing the next speaker. Um, Then um, here we have uh, Timo Gierlich. So yeah, you can start with your two minutes. Do you see my slide? Not yet. Do you see, the, do you see them now? No, we just see your camera. OK, then I probably want to. Hmm. OK, well, anyway, then I go without. doesn't matter. Okay. So um, yeah, um, talking about the weight transfer problem. So when we derive learning rules for neural networks uh, from first principle, we typically do this by gradient descent on a loss function. However, this often leads to symmetry constraints on the con connectivity or the weight updates. So in or normal artificial neural nets, as used in deep learning, this poses no problem at all. But I'm dealing with physical spiking systems, such as the brain or neuromorphic hardware, where these constraints violate the locality principle. This is the so-called weight transfer problem, being one reason why vanilla backdrop is regarded as biologically implausible. Therefore, in my work, I want to solve this uh, infamous weight transfer problem in spiking networks. So the core idea is that unequal reciprocal weights leave a characteristic mark on the spike timing statistics of the two neurons. Or to be more precise, they lead to a skewness caused by the unequal weight, which you can't see because I don't have my slides. Uh, with that, we can exploit. Uh, so so these, uh, this skewness in the distribution, we can exploit by STDP with a special anti-heavy STDT kernel. Um, and with our novel homeostatic plasticity rule called SAL for spike-based alignment learning, reciprocal weights can be aligned using only local information. So this SAL is designed as an add-on to augment existing error correcting learning rules that suffer from the weight transfer problem. And we apply this to two examples. One are generative spiking networks for Bayesian computing. And the other one is um, that SAL enables biologically plausible backpropagation. And we throw, show this uh, in a new uh, deep spiking network of cortical microcircuits where we can outperform uh, feedback alignment. And if you, if you actually want to see the plots, then please come to my poster. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I just saw for the next speaker, Dan recommended to maybe unshare and reshare, and then maybe we can get slides for the next one. Sorry, it didn't work for you. Um, and then our next speaker should be Wojko Pjanovic. Um, please come on stage. Hi, yes. Thank you. Let me see if I can indeed share screen. Is it visible? Not yet. Ah, now it worked. Perfect. Okay, perfect. Nice. Good. Well, thank you for coming, and I'm excited to be here. My name is Vojko Pjanovic, and I'll be discussing our work on uh, bridging sampling methods with attractor dynamics and spiking models of head direction systems. Uh, in the realm of neural computation, two views are pert pertinent. So on the one hand, sampling-based inference is well studied in lower sensory areas, for example, decoding visual stimuli. Whereas on the other hand, uh, attractor dynamics are well studied in higher brain areas. Combining the two is not done as much. And so we propose that the head direction system is an interesting case for combining the two paradigms as no noisily encoded angular velocity estimates have to be inferred and consequently integrated onto a circular tractor to keep track of the heading direction. 
we anal analytically derive a spiking neural network based on the networks introduced by uh, Mackens and Podlaski before, performing approximate Bayesian filtering. And we use this framework to model the head direction system by combining, on the one hand, the sampling-based inference with, on the other hand, the attractor dynamics. And so uh, angular velocity updates are inferred from sensory neurons and then get integrated onto a ring attractor. As you can see, this effectively allows us to model the head direction system, inferring the direction while concurrently maintaining the bump in neural activity also uh, observed in experimental settings. From the model, we deduce and propose concrete testable predictions about short and long-term neural activity correlation patterns, correlated subthreshold voltages, and statistics for the bump movement of neural activity. If you're interested in inference and attractors, I invite you to come by and have a fruit fly slash fruitful discussion. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. And thank you. then um, our next speaker seems to be Claire. And uh, yeah, so uh, Claire, if you can hear us, join us. Otherwise, we somehow you disappeared from our radar. So if you can hear us, please refresh your browser. Um, and then hopefully we can pull you on. And the same is uh, for Ching, Ching Yu. Okay, yeah, great. So I think I can reinvite her now uh, to the wing. Can you see me and hear me? Um, only yes. hear you. Uh, so uh, we can. <laughs> yeah, great. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, so hi everyone. Sorry for the little technical issue. So I'm Claire, a postdoc at FMI Basel, and I'm interested in uh, memory storage and retrieval. So whenever memorizing information, like the smell of coffee, classical views suggest that connectivity between a subset of excitatory neurons will increase and this will form excitatory assemblies. However, several recent uh, uh, experimental findings have challenged these views, and this led us to make the hypothesis that memories are encoded in excitatory inhibitory assemblies, namely groups of both excitatory and inhibitory neurons, which become highly connected after learning. So an important question now is, how do these EI assemblies affect memory function? So to address this, we built a realistic, biologically constrained spiking neural network model of olfactory cortex. Indeed, this brain region is a good model system to search for EI assemblies. So we first studied the geometry of neural activity. In other words, we looked at how network activity in response to various orders is organized in neural state space, where each axis represents the activity of one neuron. Looking at the geometry is interesting because it informs us about the computational properties of the network. We found that EI assemblies locally constrained auto-evoked activity, and this reorganization enhanced the retrieval of learned information while also providing a distance metric between new order inputs and learned orders. We then took a complementary approach and partially silenced inhibitory neurons. This generated additional predictions that were confirmed experimentally. If I trigger the interest, come have a chat at the virtual poster session. Thank you very much, Claire. And then we have our last speaker, um, Xing Yu Yu. Can you see my screen now? Yeah, we can see it. OK. Hello, everyone. In this presentation, I'd like to share my work, which uses generative models to analyze the connectome patterns of the brain. We know that the inherent connectome structure in biologic brain serves as an important barrier for efficient learning. However, the complexity of connectome data makes it hard to study through simple statistic methods. And the mechanism known as genetic bottleneck suggests that the storage capacity of genes carrying this information is very limited. 
which means that genes cannot encode the connections between every neuron pair explicitly. Thus, there must exist some low-dimensional representation of connectome that controls the generation of connectivity. And in this work, I train a graph VAE conditioned on several statistics of graphs using a set of connectome data sampled from Micron's data set, which is from MySys brain. And then I compare the connectome data and generated random data to observe uh, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and compare the latent representations of the two types of data and interpolate along different dimensions. And then reconstruct the graphs at the, at the interpolated points. The results show that different dimensions we have different We not see your result, on... sorry. We just see the title slide. Maybe you move on to the next slide. Sorry. Oh, could you see my next slides? Yeah, now we can see it. OK, and the, and, and the result shows that the different dimensions has different influence on the statistics of graph, which can be seen at the bottom right. Uh, that's all. Thank you. If you are interested, please visit my poster. Thank you very much for the presentation. And thanks all uh, of you for the nice presentation despite the technical issues. And I hope a lot of you will come to the poster sessions afterwards. And I'm looking forward to it. And um, I think Dan and Friedemann are taking over now. Um, yeah, first of all, thanks to uh, and uh, for these sessions and make it really on time and very smooth. That was fun to watch. And I think Dan just has a couple of announcements uh, for the poster session, which is up next. Yes. So the, the poster session is on Zoom. The Zoom room is open now. I will paste the... the session, which is up next. Yes. Oh. Uh, I will post the, uh, the link into the chat. Uh, you can go ahead and join that straight away. The way it's going to work is there is um, a whole bunch of breakout rooms. Uh, I'm getting some feedback. Is that from you? I'm getting feedback from someone. Um, there's sorry, yeah. So there's a bunch of breakout rooms. Uh, each breakout room has the name of the presenter and the first few characters of their title. Um, so you can just move between the breakout rooms to go and talk to the uh, to, to the different poster presenters. Um, yeah, and it's open now, and you can go and join. The link is in the chat. It's also on the web page in case for some reason you get lost. Um, yeah, um, hopefully you, you enjoy the poster session, and we also see you tomorrow for for day two of uh, of Snoofer. Thank you, everyone. So yeah.